Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm John Pullinger, and it's my pleasure to welcome um, Alberto Nardelli to be our speaker this afternoon at the annual Significance Lecture. We always try for this to um, find someone who's going to inspire and provoke us, and I'm pretty confident from a conversation with Alberto over lunchtime that he's going to do that. Alberto joined The Guardian um, last year, um, just a little bit before the UK general election, and uh, I think he knows what's going to come now, but a little bit before that uh, of history of, of Alberto. Before he joined The Guardian, he was the co-founder of something called Tweetminster, um, which was a, an institution that I became very familiar with as a bit of a political geek. Um, but this managed to aggregate all of the, 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 the Twitter activity of, of, of MPs um, and provide an amazing resource and incredible entertainment also for, for, for many of us. Uh, and having done that, in 2010, he caused something of a stir by using all of the techniques and tools he developed in this to make an astonishingly accurate prediction of the 2010 election result. Um, and this um, got people very interested in how you could use social media as a kind of new way of really giving uh, insight into what was going on in the country. Now, Tweetminster um, morphed into election it was Electionista um, uh, in 2012 and became a live Twitter feed of news and polls and uh, everything that um, political um, aficionados want to see, not just in Britain but across 100 countries. It had some, election, some successes in election predictions around the world, um, but then it got to 2015 in the UK and um, I'm kind of not going to say any more about that, but he did pretty well with the 2014 European parliamentary elections. Um, but, uh, well, the, the 2015 poll here is still under investigation, and I'm not going to say any more about that. Alberto is not under investigation, and it's my great pleasure to invite you to take the floor. Fortunately, I wasn't the only one that got the <laughs> election result wrong. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for having me here to today. It's a, it's a real privilege um, to be here today. Um, when I was first invited to give this lecture back in February, I was confident I was going to give a talk about the general election. And I was hopeful on how well the polls were going to perform. I changed my mind at about five minutes past uh, 10 p.m. on the 7th of May. And so I've decided that today I'm not going to talk about um, election polls and what went wrong. Uh, lots of people far smarter than me, many of them in this room, um, will do that. And indeed, they already are dissecting um, what went wrong. Um, I'm also of the firm belief that the polling companies themselves will um, figure out uh, what, what um, went wrong. Um, it's the way science uh, progresses. It has always moved forward by learning um, from its mistakes and its errors, and I'm convinced that it will continue um, to do so. The one thing I do want to say about um, the great polling debacle of uh, 2015 is this, and I'm to some extent probably preaching uh, to the converted here, but I'm going to say it nevertheless. Um, in the weeks that followed um, the election, quite a few people started saying and suggesting that polling um, should be banned and or that it be more heavily um, regulated. Um, some individuals went as far as suggesting that polls should be put under some form of um, state control. Now, as an organization, obviously, even at the Guardian, we had lots of conversations on how do we deal um, with polls. And I, I believe the challenge that we face as a news outlet, but also the challenge that commentators face when dealing with um, polls is finding the right coverage, is finding the right balance between the way that polls are covered, between the way policies are, are covered, the way news and um, opinion is covered. And that is the challenge, like finding that right balance. But because at the end of the day, we all told the story of an election that never was. However, it would be a terrible mistake um, to dismiss um, polls. And it wouldn't just be a mistake, it would be uh, dangerous. First of all, it wouldn't work. Uh, you take countries such as Italy, where I'm originally from, we have pre-election periods where, the pub where publishing polls um, is banned. But what happens in, in practice is that coverage is filled with leaked polls and alleged figures, innuendo and rumours. The problem is you, at that point you can't verify 
um, if that pole even exists or not. What happens is that transparency um, comes less. France used to have a similar approach before a court ruled um, in 2002 that it was creating unequal access um, to information. But the second point I believe is even more important and that is what is the alternative? Lots of people outside of this room fixate on the horse race element of polls. But polling and surveys help us to understand how society thinks, how it's structured, and how it performs. And open, openly understanding um, the society that we live in is, is one of the foundations of any functioning uh, democracy. We cannot sniff, simply sniff the air to understand what the public thinks. Because we would, we would eventually end up in a place where opinion alone replaces facts and evidence. And that is a very dangerous place to be which can have devastating consequences. And that is what I want to talk about um, today. This talk is about the fragmented nature of our electorate, the pace of change before us, and a fundamental crisis of trust um, in politics. And as a warning, I give this talk not as a statistician, which I'm not, but as a journalist that deals with um, statistics. But I want to talk about the challenges that I believe we all, all of us that deal with data and statistics um, face when analyzing and attempting to provide clarity ar around some of the most important, critical, and complicated um, issues. But every story needs a beginning, so I'm forced to talk a little bit about the last election. Um, just under 25% of, of uh, the vote in May went to parties other than the Conservatives, Labour, and the Liberal Democrats. And that is a record high. And I think there are two important characteristics behind um, that figure. The first is um, fragmentation, so the, the measure in which those uh, votes were distributed amongst the various uh, parties. And the second is the pace at which change happened between the two elections. In 2010, UKIP won less than one million votes. In May, it won nearly four times uh, that. The Greens went from 265,000 votes to more than one million votes. The Lib Dems fell from less than seven uh, million votes uh, to more than uh, to less than two and a half million. The SNP went from less than half a million votes to more than 1.4 million votes. In terms, of, in terms of the two main parties, the election result can be s summarized quite simply in a nutshell. The Conservatives did well with voters that turn out. Labour did well with voters who don't vote. According to, <laughs> estimates, cal according to estimates calculated by um, Ipsos Mori, the Conservatives were not only the best party at holding on to their 2010 vote, but they were also the most successful party with those groups where turnout is higher, with voters aged 65 or above and among ABs. In both cases, the Conservatives registered a positive uh, swing uh, from Labour, and in both cases, the margin between the two parties was greater than the overall um, general election result. Labour was only able to achieve a, 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 an important swing in its favour or did better than the uh, Conservatives with voters aged 18 to 34, with voters in social class DE, with private and social uh, renters, and with black, Asian and minority ethnic voters. But among, uh, among all of these groups, voter turnout was lower than it was um, across the uh, country. And Labour also failed to make gains with the social group uh, C1, which is the largest chunk of the electorate, and the difference and the gap between um, Labour and the Conservatives within that group is remained at 12 points, which is fundamentally unchanged um, since the last election. Rob Ford, who is a lecturer uh, at Manchester, summarized Labour's performance very well in an article uh, for The Guardian, where he wrote, the more a seat looked like London, young, ethnically diverse, highly educated, socially liberal, the better Labour did on the whole. At a very basic level, winning an, an election is about finding the right number of voters in the right places and understanding what matters to them. In order to win an election, you need to target and build a coalition of disparate voters. The challenge for Labour is that Britain as a whole does not look like London. Its coalition of voters wasn't and still remains simply not big enough. And the one thing about non-voters is just that, they tend to not vote. 
But the conundrum for Labour's next leader is that the party will need to take different tacks in Scotland to win back seats from the SNP, to fend off UKIP's challenge in the north of the country, and to take on a dominant party in the south of the country. But it would be naive and misguided to believe that the solution to all of these different challenges lies solely in uh, policy um, decisions. It wasn't Labour's stance on austerity or on specific policies that lost it Scotland. It was the fact that the voters in Scotland no longer trusted the party. And trust is the foundation upon which any political party must build consensus and credibility. And I don't mention Labour to suggest that we draw lessons from the past elections or to suggest a course that the, that the party should take, but it's just, just as, a, as an example of the complexities that a political party faces when operating within the context of a fragmented electorate. Labour's challenge is not limited to the past election. More than half of its members, its current members, weren't members of the party before 2010. So what we are seeing is not just change between different parties, but we are, we are, we are seeing very radical change also within the political parties um, themselves. And nor is Labour's predicament unique or much different to that facing other political parties in this country. And Britain is not an exceptional case study once we compare it to other countries. A fragmented electorate that in many cases has lost trust in politicians and political parties and evolved over such a short period of time is by no means a uniquely British phenomenon. According to the most recent Eurobarometer, only one in three Europeans trust their government or their national parliament. Trust in political institutions is at a record low. A majority in only eight EU member states has a positive outlook for their country, with figures ranging from 86% in Germany to 3% in Greece, 10% in Italy, 6% in Spain, 13% in France. So in some countries, less than one person in 10 trusts their government, trusts parliament, trusts the people who they elect to represent them. But the fall in trust has also manifested itself at the ballot box. If we look at voter turnout in EU countries over time, it's, it has started to gradually fall since the 1980s. Between 1950 and 1980, voter turnout was pretty much stable at around an average of 85% across uh, Europe. That average is now roughly 65%. And in many countries, we are witnessing record low levels of participation. There are, of course, important differences between uh, countries. In Scandinavian countries, turnout tends to still be uh, very high, and in many cases is above 80%. In Germany, turnout is above um, the European average. However, in other countries, for example, in Central and uh, Eastern Europe, it has collapsed uh, compared to the levels that were registered when these countries um, really came independent following the dissolution of the uh, Soviet Union or after the collapse of communist um, regimes. Turnout uh, in, me in, in many of these countries is often below 50%. In the, in the 1990s, uh, it was around 80%. In recent elections in the Czech Republic for the European Parliament, and in recent European elections and local elections in Slovakia, turnout was below 20%. In one specific example in uh, Slovakia, turnout was 12%, and a neo-Nazi party won uh, that region's um, parliament. But the pace of change hasn't just happened at the ballot box. The pace of change that we are witnessing also has happened around various um, issues. Earlier this year, after the, US, the US Supreme Court decision legalized equal marriage across all 50 state, states, a piece in 538 titled, Change Doesn't Usually Come This Fast, and it looks at polling um, around equal marriage. It started looking at polling in 1989 and it found that, at the time, most polling companies didn't even ask the question around um, same-sex marriage. One company that did found that only 12% of Americans were in favor. There was no legal gay marriage in the US until Massachusetts made it so in 2004. Four years ago, only 5% of the US population lived in a state where equal marriage um, was legal. And it is only a couple of years that a majority of uh, the US population is in favor of equal marriage. Europe has followed a similar trajectory. 
To date, there is only one country in all of Western Europe that doesn't recognize um, same-sex unions, and that's Italy. But change has happened at a remarkable pace, not just around voting behavior, patterns, and issues. It has also happened in terms of support for political parties. Now, every country has a different system and a unique um, political system. And painting an entire continent with one broad brush is at times a pointless um, exercise that risks trivializing very complex uh, issues and misses the nuances between um, different countries. An analysis that explains in one country often misses the point in another country. This is why, for example, although Britain's first past the post system, which was designed to work for two to three parties, is clearly unfit for one of six, but simply importing a Swedish, a Spanish, a German, a French, or whatever country you like best system isn't necessarily the answer because an electoral system is a reflection of a country's culture, political structure, and importantly, its history. And finding a fix or a compromise which is based solely on present day uh, reality isn't straightforward. Nevertheless, very broadly speaking, I believe that the the fragmented nature of our electorate has manifested itself through four trends that have shaped the political party systems of Europe since the financial crash of 2008. Firstly, social democratic parties have struggled to find a coherent economic footing that satisfies all those traditionally to the left of center. They're being pulled on the left by anti-austerity movements, parties, and views, and at the same time by more centrist instincts. We see this, for example, in recent splits in Italy's Democratic Party, in the Labour leadership election, uh, in Spain's Socialist parties, and in the east of Germany with Germany's uh, SPD party competing against uh, the Linke. Second, support for populist parties has grown exponentially in several countries, in many cases pushing centre-right parties more to the right but in other cases, equally eating away at the working class base of many parties on the left. In France, for example, the UMP, or the Republicans, as they now call themselves, has often found itself jostling with the Front National. At a recent local election, for the first time, the UMP, what usually and traditionally happens is when there is a runoff vote between the Front National and one of two uh, of France's uh, two main parties, the other party invites its, its, its voters to support the socialists or the UMP. In this particular election, the UMP invited its voters to um, abstain. UKIP has pushed the conservatives to the right on several issues, and it has muzzled them on other. But Nigel Farage's party has, also, has been equally damaging towards Labour in other parts of the country. In Denmark's recent election, the parties on the centre-right competed with each other for who could have the strongest and toughest position uh, against asylum seekers. And there are numerous cases and examples of populist parties gaining in strength in Central and Eastern Europe. One very notable example is Jobbik in Hungary. Thirdly, I believe that liberal parties have suffered an identity crisis in many countries. And in a growing, in a growing number of, of places, voters are choosing between a liberal option or a moderate centre-left or centre-right option. But rarely do, and increasingly less do we see support in, in equal numbers uh, for these uh, two types of options. Why vote for the FDP when you can vote for the CDU? And what's the point of the Liberal Democrats today? And I don't mean that literally or in a cruel way, but there seems to be increasingly less room for multiple competing uh, moderate options. Voters tend to coalesce around one strong party, and around it you have a range of populist or single um, issue uh, preferences. And fourthly, I believe there has been a rise in the popularity of nationalist parties and positions. The successive wins of Viktor Orban's Fidesz in Hungary is one example of that. But I also include here nationalism, which is more loosely uh, defined and has evolved beyond what is traditionally intended as uh, nationalism, often losing the negative connotations which are associated with the uh, term. A nationalism which is instead rooted in territory, community and identity, a more global, if you may, nationalism. The SNP in Scotland is an example of this, 
all the different parties that have coalesced around calls for independence in Catalonia. In Spain, the political movement for Demos got 1.2 million votes and received 8% of the vote share, winning five seats at the European Parliament only a few months after the party was founded. Earlier this year, the Spain's People's Party lost control of Madrid, a city that it had governed for more than 24 years. Between 91 and 2011, the combined support for the People's Party and Spain's Socialist Party at local elections ranged from between 65 and 70 percent. At the last election, the two parties won a combined 52 percent of the vote. In, in Greece, elections since 1981 have been dominated by two parties, the centre-right New Democracy and the Socialist Party PASOK. Together, over the course of all elections held since then, support for the two parties combined averaged 85%. At the last election, the two parties combined got 32% of the vote. Conversely, the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn Party went from 0.3% in 2009 to more than 5% in successive elections. In France, the Front National topped a national vote for the first time at the last European Parliament election. They made unprecedented gains at the last local and um, regional elections, and recently a leader of the Front National has topped for the first time ever a presidential poll. Well, however you look at it, France's current president, Francois Hollande, is the most unpopular president of the country. We live in a, in a society of increasingly extreme views, record highs and record uh, lows, but we also live in a society of great contradictions. In Italy, the Lega, which is how the Northern League uh, now calls itself, recently won 20% of the vote in Tuscany, 19% in Marche, and 14% in Umbria, in recent regional elections. Now think about that for a moment. The party has gained notable consensus in regions that until recently it wanted to split from, it wanted to leave and divide Italy into leave these regions behind and it's now winning 20% of the vote um, in, these, in these regions. And how can we forget Beppe Grillo's Five Star Movement, a party that won 25% of the vote in 2013 and after that election many commentators were saying it's a protest vote, they'll disappear. They're still polling on exactly those same levels. But it would be reductive to explain these dramatic changes to these countries' political landscapes simply as a consequence of changing economic circumstances. We need simply to look north to understand that the changes are far more deeply rooted. The right-wing Danish People Party won the biggest share in its 20-year history in June. It emerged as the largest party in the bloc of parties to the centre-right of Denmark's political spectrum. The party now governs a minority ad administration, the Liberal Benstra does so with less than 20% of the vote. And although support for the Finns and the Progress Party had dipped slightly in recent Finnish and Norwegian elections, both parties entered government for the first time in their respective countries' history. In Sweden, the populist Sweden Democrats are, according to a YouGov poll at least, now the country's most popular political party its support has doubled at every election since 2006, while an economically strong Austria, the Freedom Party, has led numerous polls since the 2013 election, when it already won 20% 20, 20 of the vote, just behind the country's two strongest forces. So how do we, whose job it is to explain data, analyze such a fragmented and constantly evolving landscape. On the one hand, I think the question is technical. The difficulty here is lots of the tools and methods we use often rely on the past to explain the present. The solution is one of experimentation, trial and error, and to an extent, um, intellect. But I believe that that is the easy bit. A far greater challenge is how do we use data to tell stories? Once the analysis is complete, how does it contribute to an evidence-based debate? How does the story go from a circle of few to reach the many? 
And I think that is the biggest challenge, but tackling it is what should drive many of us. All the figures and examples I have mentioned in this talk are not the story. Data, most of the time, is the source. At times it is a simple, the symptom of something, but very rarely is it the story itself. During a trip to Europe in, 1930, in the 1930s, a young John F. Kennedy wrote a letter to a friend. In it he said, it seems so easy to fall into a distorted view of public affairs based more on personal bias than on informed understanding. The challenge that we face today is not new, but it remains one that is not only critical, but it remains one that we have yet to find an answer to. And I would like to conclude this talk talking about immigration. Immigration isn't by any means the single reason that explains today's political arrangements. There isn't one simple explanation as to why today's politics are the way they are. But I believe it is the one issue that best exemplifies the nature of the challenge that we face in using data to tell stories. And it shines a light on the purpose and very essence of what we do. The attitudes towards immigration cut across European politics and they touch all the different trends that I have tried to summarize today. The fragmented nature of our electorates, the pace of change, and a widespread lack of trust. According to the Eurobarometer, nearly 40% of Europeans cite immigration as the issue of most concern facing European countries, more than any other issue. Only a year ago, that proportion was less than 25%. There are only two countries now in Europe where immigration is not cited as the issue of one of the top three issues of most concern. In a poll published last month by Ipsos Mori, 50% of the British public mention immigration as among the most important issues facing the country. For a third, it is the single most important issue facing Britain. This represents the highest level of concern ever recorded by Ipsos Mori for the issue of immigration. A recent poll by YouGov showed similar findings. It revealed that for a majority of Brits, immigration is one of the worst things about this country. Now, there is no question that levels of immigration have increased significantly over the past decade, and the proportion of immigrants in several countries is at record levels. But should we discern a record level as a negative? Let's look at some numbers. Britain's foreign-born population is about 12.5% of its total population. In 2004, it was 8.9%. The UK proportion is slightly higher than Italy, slightly more than France, slightly less than Spain, but it's lower than Belgium, Sweden, Switzerland, and Australia. In Germany, more than 20% of the population has a migrant background, and 13.5% of its population is immigrant. The UK is not an exceptional case in this regard. And num but numbers aside, there are undoubtedly challenges in this debate. Integration doesn't happen over time, it takes time. There is often pressure on a country's economy, its society, its wages, its demographic, and even on its public service, services. So we shouldn't dismiss people's concerns. But I believe we have a professional and moral responsibility to strive towards a debate that is grounded in facts. More so if we believe that immigration is not only an economic and often demographic necessity in a global world, but it makes our societies and cultures richer, more diverse, and interesting. And on this particular debate, many of us have failed. The issue of immigration is too often not one of concern, but it is one of fear and negativity that often are misplaced and misinformed. Brits think that immigrants make up twice the proportion of the population as is really the case. They believe that many more people, that, that many more migrants are unemployed as actually is the case. Every day we read headlines about the true toll of mass migration on UK life. About 8 million foreigners living in Britain, millions of pounds handed out to send back home, crisis in schools, the swarms on our streets, free hotel rooms for migrant stowaways, migrants stealing our jobs, draining the NHS, and surging crime fueled, yes, by migrants. These are all real headlines. The issue here is more than just a cavalier use of statistics. It is dangerous and it has devastating consequences, especially when such untruths are repeated 
time and time again. There are risks when the perception of an issue and the facts do not align. And it doesn't matter if it creates an idea of a country that isn't. The misalignment generates fear, and it, more importantly, it drives and it defines the way individuals actually uh, behave. And in turn, this makes it more difficult for politicians and policymakers to act in a cool-headed manner, especially if they are worried about their approval ratings, especially if they do little to counter those misconceptions before it's too late, or even worse, when they build unmanageable expectations that further erode trust. The implications of all this has never been as exposed and evident as in the past month as Europe's refugee crisis escalated. Polls published last week in Germany show that a majority of the population there views immigration positively. 70% say that refugees make life in the country more interesting. 96% say that it is right for the country to accept those fleeing conflict. 37% support the current number of refugees that the country is taking, 22% say that they should take even more, and a staggering 88% say that they have or they will donate to refugees. Nearly 70% say that they want to volunteer. Opinions in the UK over the past couple of, of weeks have shifted, but if we look at the underlying numbers, for example, in polls, when questions about what should the country do specifically are asked. Two polls released in the UK this past weekend reveal that a majority of people think that the UK should not take any more refugees than it already is. In one poll, one in three even go as far as saying the country shouldn't take any refugees from Syria. The UK receives fewer asylum seekers in a year than Germany does in a month. For every Syrian refugee that Britain takes, Germany takes 27. In Munich on Saturday, there were more refugees arriving in the city in one single day than the UK has taken so far this year. The government's plan announced earlier this week to take 20,000 refugees over the course of the next five years will slightly improve that. It will mean that Germany now only takes 15 times more Syrian refugees than we do, Sweden about six times more, and following the plan which the European Commission launched this morning, France will take about double the number the UK takes. Research also released by Ipsos Mori in 2015 asked Brits what proportion of the country's immigrant population they thought were asylum seekers. The average estimate was 21%, which is three times the actual proportion. Most people thought that asylum seekers made up the largest proportion of immigrants in this country, when in reality it's the smallest proportion of immigrants in this country. In 2002, when asked to name the actual number of asylum seekers in the country, the most common answer was wrong by a factor of 10. It will be wrong, however, to deduce from all this that Germans are more generous than Brits. That's not the point that I'm trying to uh, make. What we are seeing is the consequence of years of fear-mongering by many parts of the country's media. And now, where the immigration debate and the plight of asylum seekers has been purposefully conflated. And in another country, a media that by and large has consistently had little tolerance for prejudice and has made clear distinction between terms that carry different meanings and has used statistics with a higher standard of intellectual integrity. Both didn't start doing this, though, when, tra when tragedy hit their shores. They have done this for years. The refugee crisis has also highlighted political leadership in some countries and exposed the prolonged lack of it in others. Politicians that have countered fear, falsehoods, hatred and coldness of heart in one country and politicians that have allowed antipathy towards migrants to spread and sedimentate and perpetuate, perpetuate misconceptions instead of countering them. Too often they have drafted policy or adorned mugs not on facts, but to indulge such perceptions. And they continue to set targets and expectations that they are unlikely to meet and will further erode trust. My point isn't to judge or to comment on the moral attributes of politicians. It is not our place or my place to do so. The point I'm trying to make is to highlight the link 
between politicians, the media, and public opinion, and how action, or the lack of action, influences how views are shaped over time, and how this simple fact has very tangible uh, consequences. The crisis is not only one of fragmented um, electorates that have divided opinions within countries, but has also brought to the forefront divisions between different countries. Consider the different positions that refugees, two refugees taken by several governments in Central and Eastern Europe compared with the position of several governments in Western Europe. Now, of course, many in the East were once refugees too. In 1956, 200,000 people fled Hungary and were resettled across Europe. But I don't believe the country's leaders are morally, some countries' leaders are morally better than um, others. Again, that's not the point I'm trying to make. But each is reaping what they sowed in terms of how different public opinions have been shaped, formed, and challenged over time. The choice of words that we use matters and is never accidental. Behind the use of migrant, refugee, and people, swarms or dignity, a burden or a person to help, us versus them, our meaning, values, and policy. When terms used for people fleeing war, violence, and atrocities, or those used for, to define people who are moving in search of work or a better life become pejoratives and generate antipathy, then we have a problem. And it will be dangerous to conclude that today's anti-immigration attitudes were inevitable and are now irreversible. We often hear that we should have a debate about immigration. Debates, though, are circumscribed by time, while opinions are formed and shaped over time. Having an impact, making a difference, and forming opinions is, a, is an ongoing effort and a constant work in progress. Our role as people and organizations that work with data is not to take sides, nor is to try to influence opinions with our own views and bias. That's not the point. But we should hold those with power to influence public opinion with the same standards that we judge our own work. No more, no less. Those of us that work with data have, in my view, a duty to not only to try to understand and inform those issues that matter most, but our work is also to reach people so they can make informed decisions. Data journalism will otherwise remain a niche sport. The yardstick with which we should measure what we do isn't the number of retweets or likes or citations, but it is what the public thinks about the most critical issues and our role in closing the gap between facts and perception. But data alone is not enough. On immigration, the facts are clear. Migrants are net contributors to Britain's economy. Employment levels are higher among migrants than they are among Brits and immigrants are less likely to claim benefits. There are more Brits on unemployment benefits, in fact, in Europe's richer countries than the other way around. We need a framework, yes, to analyze Europe's fragmented electorate, but we also need a voice to speak to those same voters. Our challenge is to bring together facts with stories and emotions. Data can tell us who and what we are, but to this, we need to add purpose. We need to combine meaning and storytelling. Without humanity, data alone will otherwise remain meaningless. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, and lots to think about there. But um, we now have a reasonable amount of time for questions. So the floor is open for any questions on what Alberto has said or anything that's been um, brought, coming to your mind from um, the points he's made. So, about halfway up on the right. Two more rows. Markus Elzer, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So thank you very much for this really uh, interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, you're talking, of course, of, of data journalism as maybe a way forward to get 
facts back into the discussion, but I'm wondering a little bit if maybe the train has left the station on that in the sense that um, both trust in politicians but also trust in journalists is eroding. And at least from Germany I know that there's the perception that basically all the main political parties form sort of one giant block party that basically becomes indistinguishable in terms of what they do. And similarly, uh, the journalists support this block party in the form of Lügenpresse, the lying press, who sort of uh, is just uh, supporting them in terms of hiding the truth. Uh, and social networks like Facebook become for many people the primary news source and the primary source of opinions. Uh, do you have maybe a suggestion on what the st strategy might be on that? Um, I think that's three questions. So on, <laughs> on the um, first point, I think in the same way the opinion that parts of, lots of parts of society has today on many issues, not just on immigration, I, I, I don't think that is, was inevitable and in the same way I don't believe it's um, irreversible so I think public opinions towards various issues evolves and changes over time I think the challenge is this happens over time it has taken a long time to reach the point where we are now that has accelerated obviously with the, with the financial crisis I think we shouldn't underestimate the context within uh, which events happen when people lose work or feel they earn less money, they will react in certain ways. But none of those, neither the context nor the opinion forming are fixed in time. I think they will continue to evolve. I think the second point um, on trust, I think that is fundamental. I think too often within the political debate, the um, many political parties will focus on a debate over, say, specific issues or policies. I'll give you an example from the UK election. If you take Labour's policies uh, suggested from the election, and you look at polling on every single policy proposal individually, uh, do you like tax cheats? No, we don't like tax cheats. Do you want to do nice things for the environment? Yes, we do want to do nice things for the environment. You take all those policies individually, they, they are popular. The challenge is when you have an underlying lack of trust towards, say, the economic competence of a party, or uh, trust more generally, that is when political parties struggle. I, the point on German on, on the creating that block, that's one of, is kind of what I tried to touch upon when I mentioned one of the trends I think, especially in terms of liberal parties, you, you see is you see the centrist block and little space um, for alternatives. Uh, on the question about Facebook, I think the challenge there is I wouldn't consider Facebook in itself per se to be a source, right? Facebook doesn't have journalists writing on Facebook or it doesn't have a company or organizational position. It is still individuals, organize, news organizations, journalists, etc., who are simply communicating through different uh, platforms. In the case of platforms like Facebook and Twitter, the value is that that space is open to many more individuals and, and non-professionals who often have a greater expertise than um, the professionals. But I think that that, that is more about dynamics than versus saying people trust Facebook more than they trust the BBC. Facebook does not create news per se. You, you, you can find lots of things which are good on Facebook and lots of things which are bad, but that is dependent on who has posted that information, not on what the platform itself has posted. I don't know if that makes sense. That's an answer. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Andrew Garrett, formerly a member of staff at the Royal Statistical Society, somewhat independent um, stat stroke words person. Um, your comment about the choice of words um, struck a bell with me. Um, and I think those of us who are working with data in whatever way tend to focus very much on the numbers and not enough on the words and the way in which the words we choose frame the way in which we then will interpret those numbers. And I'll just, I'll just give you an example to tempt you. Um, up until around the 4th of September, when that dreadful image was printed and shown on, on uh, many media of the Syrian boy on the beach, um, a national newspaper before that time largely wrote about the migrant crisis. Um, that same national newspaper um, thereafter, after the publication of that image and the, uh, the, the public response, 
wrote of a refugee crisis. The numbers haven't changed, but the words have. By the way, the national newspaper uh, from my rather unscientific uh, Google search is The Guardian. Um, so, on the specific, so I think there's two, point, two points there. I think specifically um, on the choice of words, we have had, and we still have debates, on the challenge with the debate around the choice of words between migrant and refugees is that the two words have very specific, they actually mean something. You, you, you are technically a refugee once you have been given asylum. So technically, a, an individual who is, say, an asylum seeker, someone who is looking for uh, to be granted uh, as, uh, asylum and then becomes a refugee. And migrant, obviously, as you know, has uh, another different meaning. So it's, it's, it's very difficult because they have different meanings. I think the challenge is not just one of when you use one or the other, because they have specific meaning. The challenge is when they are used in an interchangeable um, way and to mean something that, they, that they're not. And I think that the, the, the challenge, say, with the word migrant across almost the entirety of the media is that it is used in a pejorative um, way. And you then get into even worse nuances when you start talking about genuine asylum seekers. That doesn't mean anything. There is no such thing as a genuine um, asylum seeker. Um, specifically on The Guardian, I think it would be unfair to say that of all the media organizations uh, in the UK, The Guardian has a view on the crisis which has tried to fuel certain um, positions. And I think that is, that's, the key, that's the key issue, is that when a when sometimes you can make an error, you can use one word incorrectly. I think the challenge, the, not the challenge, the problem, is when certain words are used because they are trying to drive a certain n narrative. That, that is when you have an issue. So if you have a newspaper, who I'm not going to name, publishes stats, I don't know, there are eight million foreigners in the UK, um, and does so alongside a campaign pressing hard to close borders, uh, you can see the type of opinion that they're trying to shape. And I think that, that is the challenge and the, the, the problem when the, when the terminology that is used is done so for um, political uh, reasons, when you are purposefully being misleading. misleading. Betty, I was interested by your approach to data journalism as, as being able to close the gap between the public's perception and actual facts. And so linking to the first part of your talk, I wondered if either The Guardian or other news media actually use opinion surveys to measure the success of their own initiatives to narrow that perception gap. Um. We do lots of like polling in terms of our readers, if that was a question to, 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 under, to understand both in terms of what they're interested in, but also understand things ranging from political affiliations, understanding of um, various um, issues or topics such as um, mi migration. Um, so we do, and it does, I mean, it does to an extent influence, I think, at least what, like obviously I can't speak for the entire organization, so I'm speaking for the, the little bit that I do. Um, it does to an, an extent, but I think the risk, again, would be only to looking at, you don't want to create a situation where you're only speaking to yourself, and you're only speaking to uh, your specific audience. In our specific case, Garden readers are not representative of the entire country, far from it. Um, and I think that's, that, that, that is the other risk. And it's, it happens not just within the media, but you, you have that risk. You see it, for example, say on Twitter, where it is lots, you have a relatively large echo chamber, but you still have a uh, group which is not representative of, of, of the society, of society at large. And I think the, the, the challenge is to try and 
go beyond our personal bias and the non-representative bits of society that we mingle with to try and understand the issue, the issues in, in, in a lot, in, in a more um, representative and broader way. But also, not just from a, you know, not from a lecturing point of view, because you also it's also important to, to, to understand why things are. So why why are there those concerns behind those? Um, views. Sometimes it is a misconception, but sometimes there are genuine um, concerns. Neil Sheldon, an RSS Vice President. Um, it's again about uh, fact and perception. Uh, perception of fact. And I wonder whether there's a third element here, which is attitude. You seem to be saying that part of the reason, at least, for the uh, relatively illiberal attitude towards migration into Britain might be to do with the fact that uh, British people by and large don't understand the facts accurately. They have misconceptions of the numbers. Uh, is there evidence for this? I mean, for example, the rather more liberal, more humane attitude in Germany, does that correlate with their perception of the facts being more accurate? I think it's, there is um, complexities around various issues. So if you look specifically at the evidence, there is evidence that suggests if you had a better alignment between perception and fact, when I say evidence, I mean polling evidence, so take that with a pinch of salt. Um, it does not show, however, that everyone would change their mind. It shows that a, an important minority of individuals would have different attitudes towards issues if you had a better understanding of those issues. Now, there is also an emotional element which goes beyond you, un, the understanding of uh, the, the reality of various um, issues. And I think the other element, which is the hardest uh, to measure, if someone thinks X about an issue, and then they understand the reality of that issue. They won't. They don't immediately change their mind because opinions take time to form. They link to emotional aspects, to experience, etc., etc., etc. But I do believe that there is evidence which suggests that if you had a more informed debate, then you you would start shifting uh, perceptions of issues. The other point, which I think is important. It, it, it's not just about the data and the facts, and this was the point I tried to make um, in, at the end, is you need to have the emotional arguments that go with those numbers. Simply, the facts on immigration are clear. Simply communicating facts will not change opinions because there are other uh, elements which are Im emotional. And that comes from the media, but it comes from the political class. If you look at if you look at the words which politicians in other countries um, use, use when they talk about immigration, Chancellor Merkel from Germany, she dedicated her New Year's speech to talking about the, the pros of immigration um, in Germany. And the moment you start, there was, a, there was a, part, there's a party in Germany called the Alternative for Germany, anti, the anti-Euro party. And when the Euro crisis started bubbling up, they started polling a little bit more than the, 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 the threshold. And, uh, to enter the German parliament, which is 5%. And lots of commentators were saying, oh, anti-Euro movements, anti-immigration movements are coming, coming to Germany. The political class united to both central right and center left to, make, to knock that argument on the head, uh, those arguments on the head. And I, I don't believe that would completely change the situation, but if you add all of those bits together, then I do believe it does have an impact. But as I said before, I also believe it would be wrong to, to underestimate some of the other reasons and some of the concerns which are genuine. Yeah. The, the UK has a growing population, Germany has a declining um, population, uh, for example. Jane Hutton, University of Warwick. Thank you, I think that actually <coughs> relates to the question I was going to ask. You talked about the growing lack of trust in politicians, which is probably associated with the declining vote. Um, do you think this political class, which unites and decides that certain issues are not open to debate, I mean, I can think of topics in this country on which there is no freedom of speech. If you dare to mention them, you're very likely to lose your job. 
If you talk to people about them when they don't feel threatened, you get a very different impression from what the political class and the media say. So do you think you have ideas about how to address the lack of trust? And do you think the media have in fact contributed to the lack of trust by aligning themselves with the political elite? Um, again, I think, so I think it's complicated in, in the sense that the difference now, I think politicians have been unpopular in other periods of time. It's that, there's, that what's happening now isn't unique. It's not that politicians were, have always been popular and now suddenly they've become unpopular. I think what's changed is we have more ex extreme views, and I don't mean extreme as in extreme left or extreme right, I mean extreme as in you have very unpopular um, politicians and political parties and, and, and the level of unpopularity, and I think this is where, for example, Facebook and social media does have an influence, not because it's their fault, but I think the behavioral dynamics um, which are triggered by more recent trends, so we shape, op opinions are shaped much more quickly uh, than uh, before. We change our mind very, very uh, quickly. We consume uh, media a lot more um, quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So that makes us change our views very, very quickly and to do so in an extreme view. I think the only way of changing that is for that issue of trust to actually be addressed by um, politicians and understanding the relationship between public opinion issues and trying as a politician to influence that. But it's very difficult. The, the hardest thing a politician does is deci if deciding when to do something that is unpopular. Because every time they do that, they put their career at risk. So it's something that they don't want to do. But there are instances and moments which, where that needs to be done. Now, Bertha, you are very popular. We're running out of time now. I've got three more people waiting. So we'll take those three three questions and then we'll draw this to a close. So right at the back, then in the middle, and then you, sir, in the near the front. Uh, Clive Berman. I'd like to challenge you as to whether you're, if you like, deluding yourself about what the norm is. Is it historically that it's always been like this, a fragmented and mistrust and volatile, and that aspects of the 20th century were the anomaly? Because certainly before the Renaissance and the rise of evidence, everything was opinion. So is it that we're looking at the, uh, the problem the wrong way round? that we're conditioned by it being like it was in the 20th century, and that's not the norm. Um, I think politically, at least, if you, it's very difficult, you, you, it's very hard to create a theory which works, say, you, you know, across tens of, di of very different European countries. But if you look at the fragmentation within the political system within most European countries, you have unprecedented levels of fragmentation and you have the emergence of new parties which gain popularity very, very quickly and the number of parties that do that is without um, precedent. And this is the point I was trying to make before about how quickly things happen. The Five Star Movement, very quickly, 25% of the vote. For them, was a few months after it was founded as a party, won 8% of the vote. These are very big shifts and very quick changes over a very short very short periods um, of time. And if you look at that fragmentation of the um, electorate in multiple countries, I do believe that, yes, it is a trend which is uh, new. The popularity point, as I said before, I, I don't think the fact that politicians are being unpopular is a new thing. I think the context is different and the fact that opinions are shaped very, very quickly uh, with, and within that context, the unpopularity of politicians uh, can lead to, you know, has potentially you know, dangerous consequences if, 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 if it's not um, dealt with, um, for, 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 for example. So I think lots of the elements are not new. I think the pace and the context, I think that is definitely unprecedented. Hello, um, I'm Steve Fisher from the University of Oxford. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, slightly different question. Uh, as a data journalist, what do you think of how academic statisticians and data analysts 
um, are communicating their research and what advice would you have for us? Um, I think working more, more with um, journalists, I, I, I think there are some very good examples. I think the challenge is how do you reach that bigger public and I think lots of that can happen through uh, collaboration where you take academic research and you combine that with um, storytelling and how that story uh, is told and I think a lot more needs to happen in in that space because otherwise you have these separate conversations and, and, and both of them tend to be very not insular, insular is the wrong word, I, I, I think small, you have the academic community that talks to themselves and the data journalism, journalist community is very very similar, most, it is a, to most extent it is a small community that pats itself on the back talking about how wonderful a <laughs> visualization um, looks when in reality I think if you had the that collaboration the impact could be a lot greater and, and I think data driven journalism would benefit greatly from that. Yeah. Um, what do you say to the argument that we think we live in an age of extreme views because we've forgotten what the past is like? You gave the example of same-sex marriage, a view that would seem extreme now would have been quite common in 1960 and equally in race relations or in economic policy you could give examples of attitudes from the 1960s which we, you would not even express now, they'd be off the scale of unacceptability. Isn't it just that things look extreme um, because there is actually so much more of a consensus, if anything? Um, well, it's not necessarily. I think the, again, I think what is different uh, isn't the fact that opinions change over time and what seemed impossible 20, 30 years ago is today the norm. I think what is different is the pace at which those opinions uh, change. And also, I agree, I absolutely agree with the point that we very easily forget and the past and, pa and past experience. And that's one of the challenges. So, for example, um, one of the challenges, I think, in terms of, say, um, polling is it is much harder to adjust based on the past when, when you have realities which you, you didn't have before. So you, you look at um, the last election, you know, difficult elements like how would, you know, how would UKIP's vote distribute across um, the country or elements like that. It's, it, in, you don't have that many examples in the past to, to look at and say this is how, when something similar happened in the past, this is what um, happened. Um, I think, again, I think on the extreme view, it is on one hand reflected in the velocity at which change happens, and equal marriage is, a, is an example. That if, if you look at other movements and the pace at which other rights were uh, conquered, it, they happen over periods of time, which was a lot, a lot longer. I mean, when you had the last presidential election, equal marriage was mm, mm, something that not many people um, taught the first, Obama's first election, uh, election win. It, it, it was an issue that no one um, talked about. Um, and if you think about how quickly that has changed, and that's the, I think that again is the, is the big difference. And again, I think w when I say extreme views, if you look at factors like economic, you know, economic crisis or uh, unemployment levels or other uh, bits of evidence, there isn't any evidence that suggests that only 20% of people in France should have a positive view of Hollande and so he's a lot more unpopular than any, he hasn't done anything that different to a French president in a moment of economic um, crisis and you have these that, 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 that's what I mean by so you have the uh, extreme, more extreme views in that sense and the, the, the quick, the velocity at which they are formed but also um, change and I think those are elements which are unprecedented and a lot of them have to do with behavioural um, elements I think. You know, if you think about the way, again, we, for example, the way we consume news, we consume news in 
chunks. We spend a lot less time um, reading bits of a news article and then moving on to the next thing. Or the difficulty that an issue has to stay on the news agenda for more than a few days. It's very hard to keep the focus on one issue because people want to move on. Climate change is the best example of that. It's very hard as a news organization to cover climate change because the impact of it is going to be in the longer term and there isn't going to be news every single day. And I think all of those dynamics together make it so that things happen very, very uh, quickly and happen at the extreme ends of public opinion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful lecture and thank you so much.